this is a hungry team and uh, seeing a lot of really good things. We got a schedule where the kids are trying to keep the kids as fresh as we can keep them and I think they've uh, responded to that. We got physical guys. I think really what I've seen is I think the defense is really taking a notch up on a defensive line. So really competitive battles in the uh, inside runs and the outside runs, those things. The offense is, is done a tremendous job uh, transitioning from the spring to the fall. They've given us some really tough looks, you know, both in the pass game and the run game, formationally, motion stuff. You know, they got a ton of playmakers over there too. So I'm excited to watch those guys get the ball in their hands and run around when it's not us trying to tackle them, somebody else. Our effort has been tremendous on special teams in all phases. And uh, obviously we always want a bunch of guys, you know, we're, we're trying to tell them whoa, then go, which means, hey, there's sometimes we need to slow down rather than speed up. And we're spending more time on that. There is no issues with uh, getting a, a very interested and invested group out there for every drill, everything we're doing. I feel good right now that we could go into a game and uh, operate in a way that we could win a game. You know, I think we could go play right now. There's there's obviously stuff we still need to clean up, but we're ready to go. Man, we just hungry. We ready to play a game. So next week is here, so I just can't wait. I, I'm really excited about where we're at, but um, I'm a perfectionist. I want to I want us to take the next step as a team. Um, you know, we 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 have to get better as an offense, uh, as a team, and I have to get better as a quarterback. There's a lot of history here, and we know that. We all know that. We came in knowing that. And one thing we all wanted to do coming in here is just to bring it back that culture and bring it back into its uh, prime. I, I think first games at, at any level of football are, are lost more than they're won. So take care of the football. Understand we got a good team, we got a good defense, we got a good kicking game. We're cleaning stuff up little by little. Uh, then it's about getting a team ready to fly overseas and play. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Sever, and welcome to another season of Big Red Wrap-Up on Nebraska Public Media. The season starts a week early, but it was a long off-season, and we'll break that down for you with, of course, a couple former Oscars, Jay Moore and Damon Benning. Did it feel like that to you guys, like it was because of all the new names and new faces, that it was a really long off-season? It was, it, was, it, was, it was a long one to me. You get the, the change of the staff in the middle of the last season, so you, you know those changes are coming, you get 17 newcomers added. Mm. Uh, via the transfer portal and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was very extended. But uh, I've, I've done my best to um, almost take a little more of a backseat view. Just kind of a de definitely more in wait and see mode mm -hmm. this, this year more than any, than any other um, seasons coming into it. Just I'm excited to see what they're going to bring. But I'm also just kind of, you know, we've, there's been too much talking in previous seasons going yeah. forward. So I'm just like, okay, let's, let's see what you guys got now. Yeah, I think that's part of it, right? We only heard from the coach. Uh, directly after spring and then you know it was basically until fall camp and so it seemed like a long time and I think with this football team uh, they feel like they've got a lot to prove and when you're kind of edgy like that and you have a bad taste in your mouth from the previous season you made a ton of changes it can seem like an eternity to get that first one even though it's week zero. Mm -hmm. I, I always put you on the hot seat that's what I like to do. Uh, <laughs> bigger newcomers the coaches or the players? Definitely the coaches. Um, I, I mean, those guys have got to find a way to grab common language, teach common language, be on the same page in crunch time, and, and trust one another. Mm -hmm. Players want to be led, right? I don't so much worry about those guys. I think deep down most people want to be led. Sometimes it's the adults in the room that, mm -hmm. that kind of get in the way, but I think it's without question it's on the coaches. I'll ask you the same question before, but we want to remind you we got a lot to get to tonight, so we want to hear from you. You got call centers up and running, as always, ready for your calls. We're joined tonight by students from the University of Nebraska's College of Journalism and MassCom. Woohoo! They'll be with us throughout the season enjoying Valentino's Pizza and taking your calls. Let's get them to work. You can also text or email us your comments and questions to bigred at nebraskapublicmedia.org. We're also monitoring social media accounts. Send us your thoughts on the Big Red Wrap Up Facebook page and Twitter account, and we'll answer as many of the questions as we can tonight. And of course, don't forget to head to our website and download your copy of the 2022 Nebraska football schedule poster. You can print it out for your home or your office to keep up to date throughout the year on the Husker football scores. We're looking forward to putting a lot more W's in this year. Of course, our sideline survey is back. 
and ready for your vote tonight as well. Which will be more successful this season for Nebraska? Will it be the offense, the defense, or special teams? Head to the website right now to vote and head back each week for a brand new survey. So I throw that question to you. Is it going to be the newcomers and the coaching staff or the players that's more important? You know, I'm going to side with Damon. I think uh, I will, I'm very excited to see Oshawn, Oshawn Mathis. Sure. Just because bringing the, you know, being a defensive end, edge pass rusher, I'm really excited to see what he does. But I have to side with Damon. And um, I think the this, this staff, and the one thing it's, and he alluded to this already, is dealing with the adults in the room, dealing with Scott Frost. And I think, uh, obviously, Scott bringing the, the same staff with him from Central Florida, I think one of the issues were, and, and, it's just, and this is just my opinion, a lot of yes men in that room. And I don't think Mickey Joseph, you know, and these Mark guys on these Mark Whipple, I don't think they're yes men. I think they're going to challenge Scott. And I think that's what Scott needs is to be challenged and, and just to get him out of his comfort, comfort zone a little bit. And obviously, he has been out of his comfort zone the last four years because he hasn't won football games. Mm -hmm. So I think those, those newcomers are going, to, are going to bring forth. And, you know, if they don't like what's being done, I think they're going to, they're going to step up and say something. Where I don't know if that was the same, if that was, um, that, if that was consistent with the previous staff. I, I think this is right. The best coach you ever had was Frank Solich, especially in terms of his detail. How much difference does a running back coach make? Can he make with this group? Yeah, I, th I think in this particular case, a ton. You know, I, I was drawn to Coach Applewhite from the get-go right after, uh, you know, junior days and getting a chance to spend time with him and then kind of knowing what's going on in that running back room. You know, there needed to be a little more maturity, a little growing up. Some roles were defined. Mm -hmm. Guys needed to understand and embrace where they were and what they were, and he's all business. He's very direct, um, he loves you hard, he coaches hard, and I think he got rid of a lot of the, the extracurricular that was, that was going on in that room, and he's got a lot of talent. It's as deep a room as, as they've had in quite some time, so you gotta go back to Hurd, Aaron Green, mm -hmm. uh, Rex Burkhead, and uh, Amir Abdullah. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my opinion. Now, I don't know if they have that kind of upside, right? I mean, those guys were really good, but on the surface at first blush, the running back room, in my opinion, outside of the linebacking core, is the deepest position on the football team. It's not a change in coaches, but it's a change in responsibility. What do you think about Mike Dawson having both the D-line and those outside linebackers or edge guys? You know, I think it's it, it's going to work well, in my opinion, because those guys, you, and it's more the outside guys working with, you want to call them a three technique, a five technique, the defensive tackles, I think there there is some cohesiveness that you have to have, but I do like the same it's language. The, the same language, because you guys, whether it's a, a four-man front, a five-man front, or even a potentially a six-man front, just in some situations, they all, you guys, all those people have to work on the same page. You have to be all in the unison. You got to know, hey, if you're feeling this, you know, like just the stunts, a TE stunt, a, a ET stunt, a, 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 switching gaps or just, just playing off each other, having the feel to play off each other. Um, natural, we always call them natural pass rush moves. Nothing's called, a lot of times the natural ones just are the work the best because somehow the, the, the guard oversets real quick and then boom, you know, he takes it. And, you know, sometimes those, those natural pass rush moves work better. But just having that same communication across the board, hearing it, I think it's going to work, work well. And he, Dawson's, I mean, I've, I've got to know him uh, a little bit better this offseason. I, I really like what he's about. I really like what he's teaching and what he's bringing. Just, you know, being here initially, being with the Giants, getting some of the NFL. Um, I know he's, he's been in other places as well. Mm -hmm. but, but coming back and bringing that knowledge and just and really just stressing those guys, stressing to those guys, effort, assignment, alignment, physical, hand placement, all that stuff. So I think it's, it's, a good, it's a good matchup. Casey Thompson takes over at quarterback, moving back to offense. You mentioned how deep the running back room is. It's a pretty deep quarterback room. Some guys with experience, talented guys. What do you like to think about the room? Yeah, I, I do. I, and I think the tutelage has been pretty good, right? We saw in the spring game, and it was, you know, it wasn't in-depth and real fancy, but the guys look the same, the mechanics, mm -hmm. the play fakes, the run action. I felt like, okay, you know, from top to bottom, they were being coached up pretty well. You know, Casey Thompson obviously named the starter uh, last week. He's he's the veteran. He's the savvy guy of the bunch who's made the fewest mistakes. I don't I don't know. It's kind of one of those things where you tell somebody that, hey, keep your hands to yourself versus don't touch. Mm. I prefer he say, you know, you say, hey, he's taking the best care of the football as opposed to he's made fewer mistakes, sure. right? Like, but that's just me being particular. But I think with Casey Thompson. He told you exactly who he is. He is a perfectionist. He's like that in his press conferences. He's like that in his scouting detail. Um, he wants to get it right. He obsesses over 
being a professional, and I think that's going to serve Nebraska's offense well, especially under duress. Mm -hmm. Are you worried at all about run-pass ratio being that Mark Whipple has generally been a, co uh, a coordinator that called more passes than runs? Uh, that's, yeah, a little bit. I think it's – He's going to learn. He's going to have to adapt. The Big to what the Big Ten does. The Big, the Big Ten does. ACC is vastly different. Obviously, when you had, you know, Pickett as his quarterback last year, you're going to you're going to throw that thing all over the field. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I th I think you just have to with weather. You deal with a little more weather here. But I hope there is some more commitment to the to the run. And hopefully that's where his mind, Scott's offensive mind, they can come together and find that happy meaning. But I think at the end of the day, it's Whip's call on, on to, to my understanding, on the majority of what's going, go, going on with this offense until, you know, and, and maybe until you know what hits the fan <laughs> some, yeah. when, as it's going to happen in, in the middle of the season. Uh, you're just going to have, you're going to have that, those, those stress tests uh, throughout the season. So I, I, I hope it's, you know, 60-40, 50-50. I hope they kind of meet there in the middle because you just have to be, in my opinion, to be successful in, in the Big Ten. One of the big things you talked about going into last year was the vocal leaders were all on defense. That secondary was kind of leading the, the yeah. talk. Yeah. Now it sounds like, according to Scott, at least, you got some vocal leaders on the offense. Do you think that could help? Yeah, and, you know, I was curious to see what would happen with the captains, right? And you had three defensive guys and one offensive guy, and the offensive guy isn't what I would necessarily call a talker, right? Vocalek is a tremendous leader because... He's a been there, done that guy, right? He's just kind of unflappable. It's not gaudy in statistics. It's more about how he goes to work. Casey Thompson isn't really a barker out mm -hmm. there. He's got good poise and good presence. But if, you know, if you're looking for guys that will kind of clap back a little bit, I, there's a Trey Palmer out sure. there. Uh, Marcus Washington is a guy that is, is, is going to step up. But for the most part, it is still kind of a defensive personality yeah. on this football team when it comes to presence. Yeah. It, is that a problem? Does the quarterback have to be a vocal leader, you think, to be good? For your team to be good? I don't, good I don't, in my opinion, I've been asked this a few times. I don't think it does. I look at Zach Taylor, the head coach of Cincinnati Bengals. Not a vocal, he wasn't a vocal guy. He, he was a communicator. He was not a rah-rah. He was not a guy that's going to get into your face. Mm. He wanted to communicate with his guys and just get, say, hey, what are you seeing? And, and no, you're, he'll, he, he, there was no problem telling a guy who he was wrong. He, was just, he just did it in a very calm demeanor. There was no yelling. There was no getting, getting uh, into anyone's face. It was just a very calm it's just having a, a grown-up conversation, really. That's what it came, yeah. came down to. And I know, I mean, you know, you were around Tommy Fraser, way yeah. different of a, of a vocal, uh, vastly, very, different. vastly different. Um, you know, other quarterbacks. I mean, Jamal Lord, vastly different. You know, he, Jamal was actually pretty quiet. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He, he wasn't. He wasn't a big um, a raw raw guy. So um, I've been around multiple guys, but I just look at Zach. I mean, he's yeah. just he's the same way as a head coach. You know, he doesn't get too too high or too low. And I think that's what makes a really good quarterback. Defensive side. More concern about replacing the guys on the defensive line or the guys in the secondary? Oh, wow, great question. Um, ooh. They have more bodies in the secondary, mm -hmm. but they're replacing more leadership with Dismuke and Deontay Williams. They don't have near as many options in, along that defensive line. I think it's thin. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you're going to get out of Drew this Saturday in Ireland, maybe 10, 12, 15 plays. Um, but outside of that, I, I'm not in love with their depth on the defensive line. At least in the secondary, they have body types, right? You've got Omar Brown. You've got Singleton. Uh, you've got Farmer. Tommy Hill. Uh, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's going to be the he's going to be the opposite oh, the corner. corner. Yeah. He's fantastic, mm -hmm. and he's got a chance to be big time. And they have one of the better tandems at cornerback, at least early from what I've seen in terms of how they move and watching Newsom play last year involved, they potentially have a very explosive tandem at corner. D-line's going to be important this week because everything, everybody believes Northwestern's going to try to establish the run. What do you think about the guys they have? Few coming back, but all these new faces. Yeah, I mean, you look at Stephon Wynn that transferred in from um, Alabama. We were referencing uh, the guy from Texas Tech coming in. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, that came in late. See what he's able to do with, you know, not having a ton of camp, um, you know, a couple weeks of camp in him. But I look at a guy like Ty Robinson. This is this is a big year for him. Yeah, you know, he can make some money actually. Oh, you know, a, a lot. But he has to be more consistent. Yeah. He makes a ton of of flash plays. Look at you know he played very very well against Michigan last year. But then he shows up against a team like Wisconsin. Doesn't play very well last year. He has to mature, find that consistency. But another thing, you know, we I talked I, I mentioned Ochan Mathis. That having that presence out there, and if everything you know, if he lives up to the hype, 
that guy can help out those those interior guys as well. Just because if he's as good as he's supposed to be, just the way they're the sliding protections, the way they you know have to do certain things with chipping, keeping tight ends within the formation, that will help out everyone else. So it's he will help the D line. But I look at you know the new guys coming up, the transfers. But Ty Robinson needs to step up his play and become way more consistent. I agree. But you know, I mean, I said this earlier. Outside of running back room, the outside linebackers, that whole string. Mm -hmm. Right, if you talk Maga Clements, Hausman, Reimer, Henrich, those guys can all play. Mm -hmm. You look at outside, Caleb Tanner, Garrett Nelson, O'Shawn Mathis, mm -hmm. and even Jamari, Jamari Butler, Butler and Blaze Gunderson, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gunderson's playing on a lot of other teams, right? That yep. is a deep mm -hmm. unit. And I think seeing both Nelson and Tanner captains, even though Tanner may not be a starter, kind of harkens me back to, unfortunately, my days as a captain not always a full-time starter where he's come such a long way in terms of his behavior and what the program means to him mm -hmm. and what he wants to contribute to the program. He, that's a really good story with a really good group, right? They're calling them edge guys now yeah. because they're using them like D linemen, mm -hmm. especially to what I call the closed side or to the, to the tight end side. And I think it's gonna help out the two interior guys because they don't have a ton of depth. Reimer's going to have a huge season, couldn't he? Yeah, you, you think about what he's done these first couple of years, if he's fully healthy. He's a lot like Jay was describing, kind of boom or bust with, <laughs> um, you know, he's, a, he's been a feast or famine guy. Mm -hmm. Consistency is the key for him. He got his partner in crime to stay healthy last year. Yeah. Luke can this year. That's a heck of a tandem because he's an explosive guy. I thought early on, I mean, some people may chuckle, He's got Sunday type talent sure. somewhere Athlete. fitting in, and if he if he just stays healthy, he's a big time talent. Mm. With the season opener in Ireland, the Huskers spoke to on Sunday to the media regarding their upcoming game. We've been talking to our players a lot about handling this the right way and making sure it's a business trip, but. If we have enough work done and uh, feel confident enough with what we're doing going over there, I think the more confident we are about that, the more we can just enjoy another country. We're going to go out there and let it rip. And I, I'm going to have more conversations with them about it. They've earned the right to be confident. Uh, I'm sure Northwestern is too. I think they're going to be a really good team this year. Um, but I don't want the guys to worry about anything. Um, we're just going to go out and play the best football we can and try to make great plays. I have complete confidence in this game plan and the offense and the coaching staff and um, just trying to keep everybody positive and relaxed. We had a really good practice today, um, almost no mistakes uh, on the whole day, whether, whether that was against the defense or the scouts. Um, the game plan is really, really good and solid right now. You know, we're always focused on game week, but being even more uber focused on uh, what we can do as players and as leaders to kind of bring everybody in and focus on what they need to focus on instead of looking at all this. I know how hungry our team is. Um, you know, there's been th some things written about our team that I think have provided us a little extra motivation and, and could, could help us. Uh, so it's going to be two teams that are hungry over there. Um, you know, we, we can't go into the game with the exact same game plan and expect it to work the same. I'm sure they've been working on, on those things. and. Um, I'm expecting a really good game. We're pleased to welcome from Dublin, Sean Callahan, who's traveling, of course, covering the team. How's the trip been, Sean? How you doing, man? Hey, I'm hanging in there. Um, jet lag. I'm kind of there, but we had an evening flight uh, left Chicago about 930. So I was able to sleep on the plane as much as I could. Uh, been running around. As we know, it's um, past midnight now, almost here locally. So um, it is... Uh, doing my best but day one you know is always the toughest when you go over to Europe we heard so many people talking about how their flights were full of Husker fans what was it like for your flight how many Husker fans have you seen yeah 95 percent of my plane I was on a United flight out of Chicago was full of Husker fans I mean it was just wall to wall when we landed in the Dublin airport uh, there was a full Aer Lingus plane the team charter plane, mm. an American flight, and a United flight, all that landed at the same time. So uh, over a 1,000 Nebraska fans landed around 11 o'clock in the airport when the team landed. So it was 
a scene straight out of a movie um, just with the number of fans kind of hanging out around customs in the bag area, just waiting for their bags and the Husker team just kind of poured right through the area. It was very cool to see. We saw a lot of video of the Husker team going through the airport after they landed. What's their schedule like? What are they doing now? What are they going to do tomorrow? Well, Tuesday, the schedule was, was pretty laid back. Mm -hmm. They got in around 11. Uh, the first thing they did was they went over to Aviva Stadium, checked out the stadium. The practice field is actually a rugby field mm. next door. It is field turf, which I find interesting that they're not going to be able to practice on grass the next three days. But it is literally right, and you're looking at the picture, right next to the stadium. Um, they're 45 minutes away, though, at the Powers Court mm. Hotel. Um, it's a luxurious five-star autograph collection hotel was once a Ritz Carlton. Um, they're staying out there. Um, and so they went out there, checked in. Then they went back to a dinner here on Tuesday night at the mansion house. Um, so it, it's been a busy day one schedule. They're going to practice locally at around one o'clock on Wednesday. So guys will get some rest. I, I think that's the key. You want players um, tonight, get as much rest as possible to feel like when they get up on Wednesday that, hey, you know what, I'm back to normal. You know, we've heard a lot about this trip compared to what Northwestern's doing. This is a business trip for Nebraska, right? It's not about going and having a good time and seeing stuff. It's about going there to win this game. Well, and they're 45 minutes away from Dublin City Center. I mean, they are out on a isolated compound, um, you know, a 1,200-acre uh, two golf course resort. Mm -hmm. uh, Notre Dame actually stays where they're staying when Notre Dame plays in Ireland as well. So it is a, a very, very nice property. In fact, uh, the teams that have stayed at Powers Court are undefeated in Ireland, if that means anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, Northwestern is staying um, at the Clayton House in Burlington, um, on Burlington, right near the stadium. Mm. So you could only, I stayed at the hotel in December when I was out here you could walk to the stadium compared to where Nebraska's at so it is a different layout the Wildcats will not get in till Wednesday yep. they'll practice on Thursday so Nebraska will do one more day on the front end Northwestern on the other hand will right. stay another day on the back end because they don't have a buy they have a bye week the following week I understand you're having a good time we have a picture demonstrating what kind of time you have Andy Kendi there Rob McCartney is that some Guinness yeah, that was just for props, though, right? No, but yeah, we uh, – so, um, and I know we had a picture, but we were at Buskers, the official bar for the Huskers. Uh, that was a uh, one of the pubs um, that's really kind of taken on right in the Temple Bar District. And literally, this sign was right outside there, and I'm like, well uh, – there's going to be a lot of Nebraska fans in this bar throughout the week. Now, a lot of the Nebraska fans, Michael, are not – the ones that came in, they're not in Dublin yet. I think if you get in this early, you're exploring the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to make your way back into Dublin on Thursday for the game. Um, so the folks that we saw today, a lot of those people were on longer gotcha. seven, eight, nine day trips. Mm -hmm. And they're going to explore uh, the rest of the country before getting back to Dublin here later in the week. Sean, we appreciate it. Get some rest, man. I will. Hey, thank you guys. And uh, looking forward to uh, watching some college football on Saturday. We appreciate it, Sean. We'll check back later in the show with you as well. All right, thanks. All right, of course, one of the big questions is the hot seat question. Um, how many wins do they have to have? How does it have to happen and everything? Do you feel it is a true hot seat and how many games do they have to win? <laughs> Not to put any pressure on you. <laughs> wow. I, the, the seat's rather warm. Yes. It's, it's rather warm, uh, unfortunately. And it's, I, I know him and Trev have had some – some tough conversations and some and some big boy conversations because I mean frankly it just needs to happen I mean you, sometimes you got to you got to put the facts above the feelings in this situation and the facts are he's he has not performed had this team performed where it, he should have been mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's only you know when it, close losses there's only to my knowledge horseshoes and hand grenades are the only thing that matters in, in, when you're being close, close right yeah, yeah. and uh, he has to get it done and I don't I don't know you've heard the he needs to be five and one for the first six games I listen. He, you better be better than seven and five, in my opinion. Otherwise, mm. it's going to be seven and five. I should say seven and five. Let me clarify: seven and five or better. Um, to if, I, if he's not, I don't foresee Trev 
bringing them back. I just, I, I think there's, there's, you have some other options that may be on the staff. You could look at that potentially. I, don't, I hate forecasting this right, right into the first first game yet, but it's a real, it's a realistic conversation you got to have because going to year five and uh, the guy hasn't sniffed six wins. Aesthetics matter though. We mentioned seventy five, but yeah. kind of matters how it happens. Absolutely. I mean, because I think. Ideally, if you're looking at this as a Husker fan and you're optimistic, you're thinking, okay, what ailed Nebraska last year? Special teams. Mm -hmm. You got a new special teams mm -hmm. coach. Uh, you wanted some consistency in the running back room. All right. You got a new quarterback. You'd seen enough of Adrian Martinez. You got a new offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. you, you, you kind of filled all the holes that you think were ailing you. You got a fantastic wide receiver coach and uh, a, a, a top-notch recruiter, so you feel pretty good. You've got... You're not running it back with three and nine guys, right? You have right. Mm -hmm. 30 new guys <laughs> that are going to be contributing. I mean, just look at the starting lineup. So I think Nebraska fans feel like the only key common component is Coach Frost. And so they built it in such a way where I think uh, it's going to reveal itself, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yep. I, I think that's really the only way you can look at it. The one thing I know is if you're a fan, proud of roster. Because you're going to need it on Saturday. Yeah. You're looking up numbers and who I was studying person. it. you got to pull up a roster. Depth before we got on here. Yeah. Get myself familiar It's going to be it. a lot of new uh -huh. guys. Next up on the show, we have an exclusive interview with Nebraska's athletic director, Trev Alberts. But first, some sights from the Huskers' fall practice, courtesy of Hale Varsity. Stay with us. We're back soon. Welcome back to the wrap up. We are joined now by the athletic director of the University of Nebraska, Trev Alberts. Thanks for taking the time. We appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here. How was your summer? Did you get a chance to do anything fun, get away? <laughs> yeah, normally in the summer we recharge a little bit and get ready for the fall, and uh, uh, that didn't happen this summer. Um, it was a uh, full board, you know, working with the Big Ten and, and uh, on our media rights deal and, and all the other things that are happening in college athletics. But uh, uh, we're excited, you know, getting back to competition, getting back to uh, attending games. That's why we're all in it. We love competition. So uh, a good summer, but a fast summer, and, and uh, it's time to go to work. Let's talk about media rights. That's a big number, obviously. Yeah. Some changes, no longer ESPN involved. What does it mean for the University of Nebraska? Well, I think it's great. I mean, you know, you think about the exposure, and, and uh, I don't think we fully grasp yet what, what it really means to be you know, in essence, our effort was to try to own Saturday for the Big Ten and its member institutions. And to start out with, you know, Fox has done such a great job with creating that, you know, uh, big noon kickoff and, and, and that window. And then you go into that CBS window, 2.30 Central, and then primetime on NBC. 
Um, I think the cross promotional stuff is just absolutely amazing. When you think about the NFL and their ability then to promote college football, I think it'll be great. Um, what we're really trying to do, Michael, is is recognizing the change in how people, um, you know, are consuming live television and generationally how different it is. It's no different than the challenge we have here. Is that you know, certain fans think having a paper ticket is absurd. We have mobile ticketing now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other fans that think, you know, not having a paper ticket is, is, isn't right. So we're trying to meet uh, all of our alumni, our fans for wherever they are. How do you consume live sports? Is it linear? Is it direct to consumer streaming? You know, is it through Twitch? I mean, <laughs> you know, um, we know there are young people that are not gonna sit down for three and a half hours and watch a game on CBS. Mm -hmm. or NBC, they're gonna consume eight minutes of content. How do we meet that? And how do we continue to grow our brand? So, you know, and then in an era of NIL and, you know, our student athletes trying to build their personal brands, uh, I think having these platforms for them mm -hmm. is really important. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting time, uh, but a lot to still work through and learn. I think football is obviously gonna be covered by this deal, but what about some of the other sports? Any concern not being associated with ESPN, being that, you know, worldwide leader kind yeah. of thing? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think the opportunity to still be part of ESPN is there. I mean, we may not have an agreement, but mm -hmm. I think we're going to appear on their platforms. Um, you know, we, we play non-conference games. We, we do that stuff. And, you know, there, there's, there's ongoing conversations. You know, I mean, I, I think the Big Ten is well aware of how important the relationship with ABC and ESPN has been over the years. I mean, you know, you think about that relationship and oftentimes, you know, a singular relationship helped each other build ultimately where we are today. Right. And I respectfully think that the Big Ten Conference helped to build ABC and ESPN and they did the same for us. And so uh, there's a long history there, mutual respect. And uh, I know Kevin and and uh, our leadership team are looking at, at additional ways that we can continue growing and maintaining that relationship. It'll just look different. Let's talk about the Husker season. I know there was a lot of things you wanted to see get done. Scott kind of moving to a CEO role, bringing in some, maybe some new coaches. Are you comfortable with the changes, what they've had a chance to bring in transfer portal-wise, coaching changes? Are you comfortable with it so far? Well, there's been a lot of change. So the discomfort is, I think, at the volume of change. It's not the actual change itself, but, uh, you know, typically that type of, you know, that much change in terms of a coaching staff and, and, uh, and with the players, it's a lot. Uh, but am I pleased? Absolutely. You know, I, I think that Scott did a really good job. You know, he, uh, I stayed out of the way. You know, I, I tend to uh, ask questions, but he had a very clear vision about what type of coaches he wanted. Um, and, and he went out and, uh, and he was able to get them uh, to come. And uh, I think they've made a remarkable difference. You know, I think uh, Coach Applewhite um, has, uh, you're going to see a totally different running back room. And uh, part of that's the talent that we brought in additionally, but I think some of the accountability and, and just his ability, you know, Mickey's Mickey, he's my buddy from uh, yeah. uh, when we played together and uh, he hasn't changed at all. Not a bit. Uh, infectious personality and uh, the players really respond to him. And I think he and Bill Bush uh, have brought a lot. You know, I think sometimes, you know, when, when you've coached for other elite coaches across the country, you, you pick something up everywhere along the line. And, the two of them, you know, having worked for some, particularly Bill Bush has worked for some, some pretty high quality head coaches who've had a lot of success. They've been able to, to bring those experiences. Of course, Coach Whipple's been a head coach before. He's been in the NFL. So, you know, I think Scott uh, has done a good job. It can't be totally comfortable when you're the guy sitting there in charge and all these other folks are coming in. Uh, and they'll work through, you know, what that structure looks like. But I think it's going really well. Um, and, you know, this... This is just a different type of team. I mean, they, they don't say much, Michael. I mean, they, they just, they don't complain. They just work. And I really hope that it translates for them on the field early so they can gain some confidence because they're paying the price. They're doing the right things. But we need to have some good news and good things happen so that they continue growing in that way. The expression was uh, mutually agreed metrics, and that went everywhere. And of course, you got a lot of questions because metrics is a number, and some people want to know a number. Do you regret all that phrase getting out there, or or do you or do you or you look at it and you say, look, that's just going to be the questions I'm getting from a, a media that is really interested in everything involving our coach? Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't regret. Um, you know, it's you know, no matter what you say, either as the head coach or the AD, your words are going to be parsed through, and that's fine. I. I think it's uh, it's part of the privilege of this place. You know, I mean, I think it would be much uh, 
uh, much scarier in my role if uh, the head coach or coordinators or administrators or presidents of the universities spoke and nobody cared what they said. So, um, but I think it's a great reminder of, of, uh, of how, um, how much people care and how much they're paying attention. So, uh, listen, you know, we, we across the board, um, it isn't just football program, all of us. I mean, we're, we're just trying to create a sense of urgency and, and uh, make sure everybody knows what the expectations are. And, and uh, you know, we're, um, we're fighting like heck, like everybody else. We always remind ourselves they're on scholarship too. Mm -hmm. uh, they're getting paid to win games too. And so the more, um, you know, we can orient ourselves uh, and our minds around competition, around grit, around perseverance, around all those things that lead to success, I think the better off we'll be. But, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with how uh, that process unfolded with Scott and with Fred, but, but Scott in particular, because it was first, and uh, just working together on, you know, mutually sort of um, mutual visioning, if you will, on making sure we're aligned about what are we trying to do here? Where are we going? What are the expectations? And so uh, I think you first have to define where you currently reside, and then you can talk about where we're going from there. You said expectations twice in that answer. Year five, what's the expectation? What's the expectation from the athletic director of the University of Nebraska for Scott Frost in year five? Well, you know, the expectations involve a lot of things, and, and a lot of people, you know, just immediately go to the wins and losses sure. expectation. But I think there's a lot of a lot that goes behind that. Wins and losses are an important part of that. I mean, they just have to be. I mean, again, we're in a kind of, a, you know, the type of business that's defined immediately by results, and and uh, I understand that. But, you know, and beyond that, uh, there's a lot of other um, uh, other part of the expectations. It's about how we operate. You know, it's about the willingness to adjust and adapt, and part of what we talked about in the changing. So we, we didn't even talk about all the changes in the recruiting area and our recruiting approach. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think those all go into the expectations and ultimately, um, and you're looking for growth for all of us, including me, you know, I mean, I, I hope I'm not a finished product. Uh, and I know Scott feels the same way. So we just need to be totally committed to growth, getting better, uh, being receptive to, uh, um, you know, the types of things that can help us. And, and, uh, I think all of those things add into the expectations about that, that will lead to the necessary wins that uh, where we want to go. But it's just not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we've got a perfect schedule and a perfect scenario now with some of the challenge, changes that have happened in college athletics to help us expedite that. Um, we have to show a, a nice uh, marginal jump here. And I think I, I'm confident we'll see that. Nebraska Volleyball, number one in the country, preseason polls. You were part of a program that had sustained success. Are you ever surprised what John Cook has done, the way things have changed, obviously, in volleyball, but he continues to just have that success? Well, I'm not surprised after getting to know John, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also well aware of just how hard it is to do what they're doing. You know, and I think the average fan, you know, when you think about where we are with some of our other programs and you think about how far it seems to, gosh, if we were winning a national championship and you think about how hard that is, I don't think the average fan understands. I think it's harder to stay there than it is to get there. And so that only speaks, you know, more to the remarkable nature of, of what John has done. And, you know, what I, what I love about John is, you know, you look at what Coach Pettit did and John was humble enough to, to look at what Terry did and then try to keep building. Mm -hmm. You know, what I love about John is John's never satisfied or comfortable because he's smart enough to know that you never stay the same. You're either getting better in athletics or you're sliding. And so John is, is willing to take calculated risks. He's willing to think differently. He's willing to adjust and adapt. And, you know, he's the type of guy that the higher the expectations are, the more it motivates him and the more he likes it. He loves that. Mm. Um, and while he may or may not have told me it's the last thing we needed uh, was to be ranked number one, I think that's, you know, in essence what drives John Cook. Yeah, you know, NIL, obviously, when it first was mentioned, people thought, oh, that's just football, maybe basketball. Mm -hmm. A volleyball program um, draws a lot of money, obviously draws a lot of eyes as well. It's really been a, a pro for women's sports as well, hasn't it? It really has, you know, and, and the reality is I'm, I'm proud of what we've done at the University of Nebraska and our team and, uh, you know, we, we are held to the same Title IX standard, Michael, uh, in the NIL space as we are in the other spaces. And so, you know, we administratively have, I think, been very intentional about making sure we are creating the platforms and the relationships that 
not just our football players or male student athletes, but all of our student athletes have an opportunity. Now, we, we can't necessarily dictate which companies are choosing to engage in those, but uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's never been more evident about the power of your personal brand as a young person. Um, you know, a lot of those um, young women on the volleyball team, because of their style of play, because of the, how they carry themselves, I mean, they happen to be, you know, brilliant students as well. I mean, mm -hmm. people want to be associated with those brands. Um, there's less risk to be associated with those brands. And so uh, it's just been really pleasing to me to see uh, our fan base companies engage in NIL deals with our student athletes and, and to see them see the benefit because it helps them along the way as they think about their future too. So lots of opportunities for them. We continue to work in that space. We continue to try to be as aggressive as we possibly can. You know, I've said this before, but mm -hmm. there's just, Michael, there's not a lot of rules right now. Right. And, you know, I feel like the best position for us is to never be first, but never be last. And so making sure we do everything we can to help the students, give our coaches every tool in the toolbox, but then my job is to protect the integrity of this. Right. And how do we balance that? How do we thread that needle? I feel really good about where we are today, um, and uh, volleyball has certainly been a beneficiary of it. Last question, before we know it, basketball season will be here. What are you hearing from Fred? What are you hearing from Amy in terms of their seasons as they head in? Well, I think they're excited. You know, Amy's got a great team coming back, mm -hmm. and um, she's got a great culture she's built. And um, I think she's really looking forward to building on that. You know, um, I think she's just getting started. She's uh, a young coach with great ability. Uh, she's got a uh, great vision. Culture is very important to her. Um, and, you know, you look at Fred, uh, um, a little bit similar to Scott. Um, really pleased with his willingness to dive in and make tough decisions and make some changes. And so the team's going to be different. It's going to look different. Um, you know, and I think what Fred is like Scott, probably understanding a little bit better is, you know, as you get multiple treks through the Big Ten Conference, understanding what style, what type of athletes necessary um, is, is really important. So I love his staff additions, uh, recent uh, hire of an assistant coach. So I'm excited for him. I, I think you'll see a different team, a different focus, different effort, and uh, I think you're going to see progress. That's really what I'm interested in, Michael, mm -hmm. is progress. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, our fans, uh, they're, they're incredible. Um, they never, ever reach out to me and demand we win mm -hmm. or what is the win-loss record. They just want to see quality play. They want to see effort. They want to see a plan. They want to see progress. So you asked me about expectations. Put that into somehow a little nutshell of expectations for all of our programs. Mm -hmm. Let's have athletic programs at the University of Nebraska that are reflective of Nebraskans because that's just who they are. Right. That's what they believe in. And I don't think we're that far off. And many of our programs are already doing that. But unfortunately, some of our high profile ones that are very, you know, in the public eye haven't necessarily been that way. And I, I feel good that we're making the necessary uh, progress to get uh, much closer to that. We appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. And, and come back with a win from Ireland. That'd be nice. We'll do that. All right. We'll be back with more of the wrap-up when we come back. Stick with us.
Welcome back to Big Red Wrap-Up. I'm Michael Severe, joined again by Sean Callahan. Time to talk some recruiting. Sean, we're expecting a possible commitment this weekend, this week? Yeah. Uh, Nebraska is on wait right now for Cam Linhard. He's an edge out of IMG Academy, uh, one of the captains for IMG Academy mm. uh, this year going into the season. He'll announce Michael on Thursday. Uh, Nebraska um, has been the long leader on this one. In fact, uh, Ashley Williams was a commit that decommitted, and a lot of people think it was because of Cam Linhart. This is who Nebraska always wanted in that spot, four-star guy, um, gives Mike Dawson kind of a player that he's been targeting for quite some time. It's almost become one of the most important positions in recruiting, right, that edge position, basically the way Nebraska's playing their defense now. Those two edge guys are going to be really important. Yeah, just the evolution of the edge, the nickel. Uh, but, yeah, you, the edge. I mean, that's the money position. Those are the guys that can get to quarterbacks with four-man rushes. And you look at this year uh, with Garrett Nelson and O'Shawn Mathis um, and Caleb Tanner and, and Blaze Gunnerson, um, how valuable that position can be. Uh, Nebraska could potentially lose three of those guys this year, um, Garrett, O'Shawn, and Caleb. Um, so Nebraska needs to get at least two. And they've got Maverick Noonan and Cam Linhart. And I think – they would probably go back to the portal, Michael, for another edge um, if they would potentially lose all three of those guys. If you want to see guys that Nebraska have their eyes on, good chance this week in Lincoln between Thursday and Friday high school games? Yeah, we got a great opening game with Bellevue West and Creighton Prep this past week. Mm -hmm. This weekend in the city of Lincoln, you could go – three games on Thursday, Friday, and, and see almost all of the top Division One talent in the state. Uh, Thursday night, you're going to get Malachi Coleman playing a game um, in Lincoln against Kearney. And then on Friday, um, you, you'll get a double header. Um, Elkhorn South is playing uh, on Friday um, in a game against Lincoln Southeast. And then you'll also get uh, a game with Lincoln Pius playing Scott's Bluff with mm -hmm. commit Brock Knutson. So the, a lot of the top talent will be in those three games, all taking place uh, really on that 84th and A area in Lincoln. Do they feel pretty good about the 2023 class in your opinion and, and what they still need to add, if anything? Yeah, the numbers are, um, you know, about where they'd want. I mean, if they get Linhart on Thursday, they'll be at 14. Um, and that's about where they want to be right now. I think defensive back remains a priority mm -hmm. um, to make sure they get at least one more defensive back, maybe another linebacker, um, a tackle too. I think they would really like a premium offensive tackle. Lance Hurd, the five-star out of Louisiana, um, is high on their list. But he, you know, I think LSU is probably still maybe the team to beat, um, but we'll see where that goes. But, you know, I think they're in good shape. That number to me probably will be around 18 high school players mm -hmm. um, in this class. And then you always are going to have to have room for transfer portal guys. Not a big senior class as well, uh, but with the portal and the way guys come and go, um, numbers are so hard to project anymore in college football. You pretty much want to save at least five for the transfer portal, right? Yeah, I feel like it started out like hold three to five. All of a sudden, it's like five to seven, mm -hmm. uh, maybe seven to ten, uh, or 15 like this year. So um, it, the transfer portal is addictive. I mean, if you get on it and like and find guys that are successful, like if this year goes really well for Nebraska, um, I think they're going to be like, hey, we're going to look to do this more often than not. Mm -hmm. We want good high school players. Um, but if Trey Palmer and guys like that can be impactful players from the portal, um, you just never know how many spots per year on average Nebraska is going to take, say, over a three, four-year period. Real quick, Sean, do we know what the visitor list will be for next week for the first home game? Is it a big one, little one? No. Um, no official visitors. I mean, I think they're just worried right now to get home from Dublin first yeah, yeah. before they um, – but it's going to be mostly local commits um, that are on their unofficials. Got to remember, almost everybody has taken their officials already – so the recruits that would come in more are going to be underclassmen players mm -hmm. uh, that would be on unofficial visits. Sean, we appreciate it. Take it easy, man. All right. Enjoy the game Saturday. All Thanks, right. guys. All right. Thanks, Sean. Be sure to vote on this week's sideline survey question. Which will be more successful this season at Nebraska? Defense, offense, or special teams? As you can see, defense, 52%. They were better last year, so it makes sense. Uh, make sure you visit the wrap-up website so you can cast your vote as well. Also, our game day photo contest is back this year. We want to see how you spend your game days. Send us your best game day picks for chances to win great prizes throughout the season. 
and you'll see your photo on that week's show. Lots of photo opportunities for everyone who is traveling this week. Make sure you send us your game days from overseas. All right, Northwestern. It's a team that's going to try to run the ball. I think we know that, right? Uh, Holinsky's got his share of problems. <clears throat> he can do certain things. What are you worried about most when it comes to Northwestern playing against Nebraska from that side of it? Yeah. You know, looking at it, just Fitzgerald's teams in the past because they do a good job of, of shortening the games. They muddy it up. You know, they don't turn the ball over. I just I look at uh, you know time of possession could be a huge key in, the, in this type of game if they're able to get the ball run if they're get, able to run the football we don't really know how D line's going to play out yet with with Nebraska we've alluded to it a little bit earlier but we still don't know there's going to be a lot of new faces depth concerns with the D line so there could be that could be that could be a definite issue in my, in my opinion going coming against the team that really wants to you know pin their ears back and 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 run the ball you know, 30, 35 times, and, and, and maybe even 40 times in a, in a game like this. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a tall test, I think, for Nebraska's defense early on. Yeah, I went back and watched this presser the other day. And yeah, me too. They've only had two media available opportunities, and so it's weird, but I, I took him at face value when he said he didn't know who was going to, or didn't want to say who his starting quarterback was. And so that led me to believe that, you know, Hull and Porter, you know, the two-headed monster that the running backs yeah. got are going to get their fair share of carries. And for Nebraska, I think they'll be tested. I mean, if, if there is a if there's an area of concern, and it's not the experience on the back end, it's got to definitely be the defensive line. And so, you know, I'm I'm sure Coach Fitzgerald will take his shots in terms of you know run action down the field pass plays, but look for a steady diet of them trying to run the football. Yeah, we said last year they only had one threat on the outside yeah. that Washington kid. Yeah. He was four, and he made the one touchdown. <laughs> He's back, so there yeah. is a little bit of threat. But their strength is their offensive line. Yeah, you, you could. There's Sturonic a chance and, yeah. that Nebraska may not get a pass rush like they may think they will the rest of the season. And if they can't. How will they be? And able you to got help? to assume they'll be left-handed, right? I right. Mean, with Skoranek playing the left tackle, yeah. very good at the guard spot over there, and so, you know, we'll see how Nebraska adjusts. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the way the defense is going to be set up this year? The way Nebraska's defense is, and the way they have it schemed. Or what is what we expect? Yeah. Well, it's it's going to be a little different, I think, than what we've seen. I, you know, talking about the edge positions. Is it a is it a three four? Is it a is it a four three type of you know? Deal. I've 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 talked with Chins before about it. Asked him questions, and yeah. he's like, eh, "It's just it can be a little bit of both." That's kind of the beauty of it. Um, it's gonna be. Listen, you're gonna, you're gonna have. I think it's gonna be a little more four three ish in my in my yeah. opinion. Kind of the back to what we're, you know we're, we're kind of used to. You know, you'll you'll get Nelson and and, and um, Mathis. You'll probably get Ty Robinson. And I don't, I don't know who the, the next interior guy might be, but uh, it's probably cold and feast. Yeah, what do you yeah. think about them getting in maybe some under front? Love it to I, help hey. them to help them to help against weak side run game. Yeah, I, I, hey, give me under, get that bubble towards the strength, right? And get Ty Robinson playing that five, you know, and maybe you have uh, uh, another outside guy, Garrett Nelson, play that stand up like a Sam in that situation, and, and he can um, play that where mm -hmm. he's at the line of as long as yeah. he's not peeking. Long as he's <laughs> but, not peeking. But, yeah, getting his head inside. Right, well, yeah. yes, but my biggest thing is in that situation, who's, who's playing your shade, though? Who's playing your nose? Who's playing that, that one well, to, towards, towards that bubble side? So I think they can play some under front if you don't necessarily like the depth mm -hmm. of your D-line and you have a plugger. Yep. Right, like a win, like a Hutmacher, yeah. somebody Hutmark, like yeah, that. Yeah, I would think yeah. maybe lean because up, right? that that he's the prototypical shade, mm -hmm. right? He yeah. he's just got to push. Yep. Didn't have to play at 45s. Yep. If you were going to pick, and this is a question uh, from Mark in Grand Island, if you were going to pick two running backs out of the ones we know, um, who'd you pick? Who would you start? I'm going with Grand Allen. Yeah. So the, the kid from junior college and the true freshman. Listen, AJ Allen is. It may be till Oklahoma. It might not take that long. I love him. Yeah. Um, uh, the guy that's the easiest to cheer for is Gabe Irvin because I like what he's done with his body. Yeah. He's come back confident. He's gonna really push. Uh, you know, Ramirez is so unselfish. He can play outside some in the slot. And he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. But you know, Grant Irvin. Uh, Ramirez, those guys will be the first three probably, but man, keep an eye on A.J. Allen. He is, uh, he's pretty good. Suspiciously, Yant was not mentioned in case people are at home were wondering. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you think, how important is uh, chemistry, culture? We haven't heard a lot about that this year, but. I, th I think that's on purpose, right? <laughs> I think they think they're trolling us. Yeah. Right? They're not, not going to say the words. Culture. 
It's always important. Bill asked the question. Yeah, it, well, it's always it's always important, yeah. but it's it gets tougher and tougher when you're bringing in 30 new guys. You know, with the transfer portal and, and guys coming and leaving, and it, it becomes more of an issue in my opinion. So that's but that's where it gets your your cultural foundation. That's where it's important because it's just like okay, this is what it is. You know, it's it's not a it's not a week to week thing. It's not a day to day thing. It's not a month to month thing. No, this is this is 365, 52 weeks a year. This is how it is Monday through Monday through Sunday. I agree that culture and chemistry is more important with the staff. Yeah. Than the yes. players. Right. Yeah. Are you drinking the Kool Aid? That is one of the questions that was asked to you from John in Bellevue. Um, I am not. You know, I'm just not a Kool Aid drinker. You're not. Like you never have a base. Yeah. You're I'm more not a water guy. Sugar free. I <laughs> I like water, and sparkling water. Yep. Yeah. Um, I I just think they're right around the seven win mark. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, I want to be all in. Uh, in terms of where I think they've gotten better because they've significantly upgraded their coaching staff. Yes. Right? I mean, I can say that with 100% certainty outside of offensive line. Offensive line, I don't know. Right? I, I, I don't. The first time offensive line coach. And you know what? You got two guys coming off injury that haven't had a lot of reps. Right? We're putting a lot of stock in Turner Corcoran and Teddy Prosk. And when you're six nine and a half and 330 pounds and you're coming off a major knee injury, yeah. confidence is of the yeah. utmost. And so not a lot of discussion about Bill Bush with special teams having right. him come in. I mean, we had that that the vote. I mean, I would think the special teams would be the improved the You'd most. You hope it would be because I don't think it can get any worse from yeah. last year. Let's do burning questions. Go ahead, real quick. Yeah, what happens in crunch time if this game is close? Yeah. Going into the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. what happens? You get punched in the mouth. Yeah, I'm a, I just special teams. I want to see the improvement, the kicking game, kicking, punting, kick coverage, all those things. I think that's a huge, a huge important uh, thing going into game one. Yeah, and kick the ball in the end zone. <laughs> the ball in the end zone. Don't let them have returns. Don't let them get cheap yardage. Don't forget to head to our website and a Facebook page to click on the prediction. Jay, Damon, and I will tell you exactly what to expect on Saturday. Nebraska kicks off the 2022 season with their Week 0 matchup against Northwestern in Ireland. You can catch the kickoff 1130 Central on Big Fox. Next Tuesday, we'll be back in game breakdown mode to recap the game with our special guests, Fox Sports and birthday boy Kevin Kugler. Football is the only thing going on this week. We're also got volleyball as well. Friday, tune in Nebraska Public Media as number one ranked Nebraska volleyball takes on Tulsa from the Bob Devaney Center. You'll see that game 630 Central right here. Special thanks to Sean Callahan for joining us from Dublin. For our student volunteers in the call center as well, for Jay Moore, Damon Benning, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week on Big Red Wrap.